And the w next week's ahead, uh, our series is we're going to remind ourselves. And what we're going to remind ourselves is what we believe. Uh, it, Paul says, remind them of these things. And so we're going to remind ourselves of what it is that we as believers believe in terms of who God is, in terms of what he's done, in terms of how we walk. Uh, and so we're going to start today. You can start two different places as you look at this. You can either start with God or you can start with Revelation. Uh, you can start with, with uh, the, the Creator or you can start with the word that the Creator said because a lot of what we know about God is in His Word. So which one do we start with? Uh, <clears throat> I start with, does anyone want to guess? God. Uh, the reason uh, for that is that uh, God expects us in human beings to be able to discern who He is, at least in some parts, just by looking around. And there is uh, a guy 50 years ago who wrote a book, uh, in fact he wrote a book about 52 years ago and then one 50, 50 years ago in uh, 2023, right at the beginning, was published. And does anybody know what that book is? <laughs> you, I'll give you a hint. If you read your email from the church, it was in there. <laughs> Fifty years ago, a guy named Francis Schaefer wrote a book called He Is There and He Is Not Silent. The, the, a couple of years ago, a, a couple of years before that, he wrote a book specifically on God is there, and then he expanded it, and he is there and he is not silent. Today we're going to do He is There. Next week we're going to do He is Not Silent. I, I just wanted to give a shout out to him because that's the kind of the title so, I, you know, I, I, so you know I didn't just steal it. You know, I gave credit where credit is due. But He is There and He is Not Silent, that is a reality that everybody needs to get. And, and so, again, like some start with the Bible, some start with God. We're starting with God. Uh, First of all, you know, why do we really study that? You know, why would we even want to address that as believers? Most people here, or everybody here that I know of, believes in, in the reality of God. Uh, but why do we want to look at the reality of God and why He's here? Uh, there's a couple of reasons, there's several reasons to study God in His character, and His existence and character as believers in Jesus Christ and remind ourselves about that. One is, I've had my doubts, okay? Uh, there's been times in my life that's like, is God really there? I've had, as I've shared before, a few months after I became a Christian, I had actually a crisis of early faith. Is that like, is this the step I just took really real? You know, is God really there? For a long time before that, I was agnostic. Um, I wasn't an atheist because you have to be intellectually dishonest to be an atheist. Uh, you, you, you are, if you claim to be an atheist, I, I really don't have a, you know, I shouldn't say this, but I, I really don't have a lot of respect uh, for somebody that claims to be an atheist because they have not experienced everything there is. And to say so, to say you're an atheist, a true atheist, not just you don't believe in God, that's different, but an atheist, you say there is no God, you are arrogant, and I won't listen to you much. You know, I'll interact with you, but, you know, that's just arrogance. But sometimes I have doubts. Uh, sometimes you might have doubts. You may not, you may. It's okay to have doubts. Um, and so it's good to look and to reflect on God, who He is, and why we know that He is. Uh, and faith is based on truth, okay? Faith is not based on some subjective feeling that one might have. Uh, be, being very generalized to poor Soren Kierkegaard, who was the father or grandfather of existentialism, ever how you want to look at it. He was a Dan, Danish uh, philosopher and Christian theologian that basically uh, looked at things that were happening and the scientific advancements and, and tried to answer the question, how do, we, how do we become, or how does somebody become a Christian? 
And when all of these things tell us parts of the Bible are wrong, science is telling us, you know, evolutionary was evolutionary kind of ideas were beginning to start around, and this is in the uh, 19th century, early 19th century, and so, you know, so he was saying there's there's things out there that you know that may really not be true, but we're just going to believe them and take what is referred to, like I said, generally as a leap of faith. And so that was, and, and it's I who take the leap of faith, as an individual who take that leap of faith. And no matter what might be the truth, you know, there's things that we need to take a leap of faith. As my history, one of my history instructors one, some, one time said, he, he thought Kierkegaard took a leap into the, hands, to the arms of Jesus. And he probably did. But the reality is, faith is based on truth. Faith is based on reality. It's not based on something that may or may not be true. It's based on truth. And so faith based on truth is not based on, on feelings. I mean, we can have feelings. Feelings are part of it. But faith itself is based on what is true. Is God true? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. That's, that's kind of an existential. And I make God true by taking this leap of faith. So it's not subjective. Also, discipleship, you know, either ourselves, you know, we just need to know who God is, remind ourselves who God is, what he does, and, and the kind of character that he has, and, and also other people. Uh, some other people may not really know uh, God, you know, don't, don't, don't know the, the full reality of God, and we as believers are to be discipling people. That doesn't miss mean evangelism. Evangelism is part of it, but also disciples. In fact, our own assurance, evangelism. If we're not assured of the reality of God, how can we t- talk to somebody else about him and what he did? So, you know, th- that evangelism is, uh, you know, the ability uh, to share Jesus. Um, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you, you really need to focus on Jesus as we share Christ, uh, yeah, but what's Jesus? God. We walk out there, there's a whole lot of people out there, and it's growing, that do not believe in the real true God. Maybe religious, religion is starting to come up, but not people who believe in the real true God. And so as we interact with people. We need to have an understanding of who he is and why we believe in that true God. And then evangelism becomes not a duty, but an honor, because we really believe in the one true God. Now, he is there. We're going to start from nature. One of the things that, that, as we look at God, God existed prior to Revelation. Not Revelation in the last book, but God existed before he spoke to Adam. God existed before he created Adam. So God existed. He is there. Nature. A framework. I'm going to look at a framework of how we think as we look at the world, how we see and think about God. Uh, first of all, and this is philosophical. Now, some might say, well, you can't talk about philosophy in church. Paul talked about philosophy in Scripture. So we'll look at that in a minute. But as we look, look at God, as we look around at the universe, we, we look around at the, what you're sitting on, as we look around and out at the, the universe, and by the way, why do I make mention of this? I'll, we'll talk about it. Well, here's a uh, chair right here, okay? And everybody look at the chair. And this chair, um, ah, it didn't hit my wife. Whew. <laughs> Thank goodness. Now, the first thing that we look at is the chair. The chair. But if you look at chair, you just came in and looked at this chair, you say, who did that? Right? Mm-hmm. Who did that? 
The first cause. How did it all begin? First cause. Who was the first cause? Because if you look at this chair, you say, okay, who did that? But you come in here and you say, who did all this? There was somebody that did it. There was a cause who did it. And the cause goes all the way back to the people who made the chair, to the people who delivered the chair here, to, to those people that what? Hmm? Made, made the frame. People that what? Mind to get the metal? Okay. All of these are, are causes. They're first causes, but there's always a cause, always a cause, all the way back to the beginning. Who was the first cause? God. So if just looking at nature, just looking at the reality of nature, there's a cause. Somewhere there was a first one. So there's either matter. Who caused matter? God. God. Or matter is always existent. That you can you can say that. Matter is always existent. Or you can say you know, the first cause was an alien who came and made it. I've heard that. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> We're just going back to the alien's cause. Who, who, who caused the alien? You know, so that doesn't answer the question. You know, it, it might have existed forever, maybe. But we'll get into some things that maybe make it more like, okay, who, who designed this chair? Somebody designed this chair. I mean... There's uh, this chair here, there's a chair in there, there's a chair in there. They're all different, but they're all designed. Somebody designed them, right? Mm -hmm. If we look around and they say, look, somebody designed this stuff, and it's called, <clears throat> called design or intelligent design, and it's becoming more and more, um, I don't want to say popular, but accepted in, in both science and philosophy is intelligent design. There's people that are w railing against it, but some of the stuff that's coming out now on intelligent design is, is like, wow, your, your eye, okay, just look at your eye, how is that designed? By the way, when I kind of practiced this, I dumped this, this over and, and it came apart a little bit. <laughs> and I said, I'm not gonna do that, you know. But, but guess what? I could look at it and see a design so I could make it, I could see the design and I could fix, the, fix it because I know somebody designed it. But look at your eye. If there's a lens in your eye, you know, it all has to work together for the eye to work. It can't be, there, there's evolution is like impossible for the eye. Then and down into microbiology, there's certain mechanics in cells that you have to have the whole thing for it to work. You just can't have one of them. Mm -hmm. Intelligent design. He made it. He designed it. He was the first cause. It's all designed. It's called a cosmological argument, by the way. Personality. All these people, all you people in here, you have personality. Where did that come from? God. Morality. It's kind of universal. That's another. You, you look at people everywhere, they have, they have a sense of morality. You know, now it can be that people just looked at things and over time it evolved so that, you know, your, your morality is so people don't die and the whole race fall, you know, gets killed and stuff, but I don't think so. Morality, where did that come from? God. By the way, you know, um, there's another one, there's another kind of argument for the existence of God, you might say. It's called the ontological argument. And people say, it's kind of a dumb argument. The argument is that we can conceive of God so he is. What? We have a conception of God. We can conceive God so he must exist. Now, actually today, that's also becoming more popular philosophically because, and more sophisticated because it's one of the arguments actually that Paul uses. There's something inside ourselves that sees the existence of God. Where did that come from? That, come, that came from God who made us in his image. Okay? So, and then, so that's, that's kind of the ontological argument is there's something inside of us that sees the existence of God. So that kind of gives us an idea that there is a God there. 
unity and diversity. Like I said, got a bunch of different chairs, unity, but a lot of diversity in chairs. Got people here, various people, everyone. What are you? A person. What are you? An individual person, diversity. Okay, that's a, one of the primary philosophical questions, by the way, is where do unity and diversity come from? And I, 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 at one time I started reading philosophy on that and I just got, you know, I, I mean, it takes me a long time to understand philosophy. I can do it. But it, it's like unity and diversity. Where does it come from? The triune God, who's unity, one, but diverse, triune. Just a framework to look at the natural world as we come into it, as we look at it. God is there. He's the first cause. How did it all begin? It looks designed, right? It, there's a personality. Where did that come from? From a person. It doesn't come from evolution. It comes from a person who created us in his image with a personality. Morality. We can conceive of God, so he is and unity and diversity, he is there. Just looking at the universe, just looking at his creation, he is there. Now, also, it's referenced in the Bible, by the way. You know, not, we're not going to just talk about philosophy. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is assumed in Scripture. He is. You know, Abraham, I mean, Abraham, Moses Asked the person in the burning bush, who should I say sent me? I am who I am. God is. The Bible understood and assumes God. Not just the Old Testament. It was John 1.1 1, 1 say. I think we're going to one where to go here. Referencing one. There we go. Second. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so beginning in the Old Testament, in the beginning was God. In the Gospel of the New Testament, one of the apostles, in the beginning was God. But the Bible also uses a cosmological argument, the argument as seen in his creation. In Psalm 136, Five and six to him who made the heavens and the earth with skill, for all his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. You begin to see the character of God because it's difficult to see some of the characteristics of God without his revelation. He is seen by his creation. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and right. Night to night reveals his knowledge. You look at the skies, you look at the heavens, and you see the hand of God in that. He is, <clears throat> oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched hands. Jeremiah, not this one, but the prophet. Nothing is too difficult for you. Again, his character and his action with us. Who also shows loving kindness to thousands, but repays the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them, O oh, great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. And you begin to see, I didn't write that up because we don't like to talk about God's judgment. <laughs> you begin to see the split. There's those who love God and those who don't. And God has different plans for each one. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, uh, the Lord is his name. And then in Romans, as Paul uses philosophical language, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Cosmological argument, you look at the world, you clearly see God. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. There are some who accept it and there are some who don't. And what's, the, what's the verses around that? 
in verses 1 through 18, 18 and 19, I mean, 1, 18 and 19, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. What's that? The ontological argument. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. They understand within themselves there's a God that they are rejecting. So you see Paul using, as a very learned man, the cosmological and the ontological argument in Scripture. It's also proven by his miracles. You see, oftentimes, as God reminds his people about faith and his reality, he says, look at the Exodus. I brought you out of Egypt with mighty works. The miraculous in the Exodus with Elijah, the prophets, and Elisha, and the greatest miracle of all, the resurrection in the New Testament. Again, when I was having a crisis of faith as a young believer, I looked at the empty tomb. It was real. You couldn't argue against it. The resurrection is real. And by the way, scholars are now more and more believing the reality that this was real. At least Jesus lived, Romans put him to death, and his disciples believed he was risen from the dead. Um, most historians will agree with that now. There was a time when they said, oh, well, it was just all a myth. But now they're seeing more and more historians saying, no, that's, that was real. Might not believe it, but they say that those events happened. His miracles. The nature of God who is there. Okay, we looked. He is there. And, and that's where we need to start. Again, there's times, not just the, for when I was young, but there's times which I, when I've kind of said, said, is he really there? And that's where I had to go back. You have to go back to the beginning. Maybe you don't, but I did. have to go back to the beginning uh, uh, of looking around and saying, yes, in nature you can see God. He is real. It's not just a figment of some myth or imagination or the, this, these Jews you know, that had some kind of, you know, they're, they're crazy anyway. They had some kind of crazy myth going on. You look at, I can say that because she's got Jewish blood in her, so it's okay. It's interesting that God spoke and chose the Jews. And they wrote it down. And they said, hey, we see God in the universe, in his hand, and his creation. And that's real. But what about this God? We see his power and his might in creation. What's his nature like? Well, we can look at God's nature in a lot of ways. A lot of people have looked at it in different ways. You can look it up on Google or if you don't want to be followed around on DuckDuckGo or something like that. Or, you know, look, look up the nature of God and there's all kinds of different articles. There's all kinds of different things. There's books written. I kind of prefer to look at it in, in kind of like the... The, the, the things that we have and the things that, 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 that we have that are like God and the things that only God has in terms of his attributes, in terms of what he's like. One is we, we, things that we have and that God have to common, which is understandable because he made us in his image, is we have intellect, right? We can think, we can reason, we know. We have emotions, we can feel. We have the will, a capacity to do. That's personality. God has personality, we have personality. In intellect, emotions, and will, right? Uh, God can do. God has emotions. He feels. Some people say he doesn't feel, but he most certainly does. He gets angry. He gets happy with us. He gets, you know, there's, he has emotion. And he has intellect. Now, there's the, the things that only he has, and that is infinity, in each one of these areas, there's a, he is infinite. That's where you get the omni. Has anybody heard of omni? Not the theater, <laughs> but, but 
omnip uh, uh, omniscient, all knowledgeable. His infinite knowledge. He has infinite power. He's sovereign, omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipresent, infinite present. He's everywhere. He isn't in everything. This isn't God, but he is everywhere. His defining nature, I think, I th I, Doug Butz and I had a conversation about this one time many years ago. What's the defining nature of God? What defines God over all things? And I, I think, and I agree, he and I agreed actually, is holiness. God is holy. He is separate. But that holiness has two kind of aspects to it. There's a separateness to it. He is separate from us, he is, but he is also totally righteous in that holiness. He has infinite love in his emotions. And um, uh, that's what, this is one of the things that, that I also philosophical kind of theological things I have. Does God have infinite emotions? How does that work? You know, is he, he has infinite love, but does he have infinite wrath? And how, you know, how does that work? You know, so you, we can think about that, but God's emotions are real. He's infinite. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. He loves, but there's also wrath. And you see that right at the beginning. You see that in Romans. You know, and, and what Paul does in Romans is say, people just standing here can look at God. They're without excuse. But in addition, they're without excuse because there's something in them that says that. They're without excuse. But now we're giving them Jesus, and they're rejecting that, and they're without excuse. God's love came down, sacrificed for us. That's his infinite love. The holy God who is there, however, which is really something, wants relationship with us. I've talked about, and we've talked about the beginning a lot. But behold, well, this is the end, but we'll talk about the beginning in a minute. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Okay, this is in the context of the church. It's the context of fellowship. It's the context of relationship. If, if you knock at the door, I'm open. I want that relationship. The other, other night I was, at, I was sitting at home and I, I hear this knock, knock on, on the door and it was like eight and it was dark and I forgot to turn the light on. I'm going, who is knocking at the door at this time of night in the dark? And so I look at them and there's this guy with a flashlight. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, do I want to open the door to this guy with the flashlight? I don't even know who he is. You know, I, I didn't want him in the house. I didn't want to invite him in. I didn't want anything. You know, so being, being the courageous guy that I am, I opened the door. There's a guy wanting to sell me AT&T uh, internet. So, you know, it's like, and, and so it's like, ah, oh, no, no, thank you. You know, technically I already got it. But, it, you know, it's like, no, I don't want to. But I didn't want, even after I learned he was a guy selling AT&T internet, I didn't want him to come in the house. God loves us, wants us to come in the house. Okay? He sees us. He saves us. He saved us. This is talking about believers here specifically, but it gives, it's kind of beyond that, beyond just believers. He wants people in the house, in his house. The only God wants relationship with us. He overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus is sitting on the throne, as, and, and as if we walk with him, if we overcome, he wants us to sit on the throne with him. Now, I mean, all of, it's, that, that, that's kind of like, how does that work? I mean, I can barely sit in the same chair with Paula. I mean, it's not going to work. How does this work? You know, that, it, that's, sometimes God uses kind of illustrations or says things that are like, how can that happen? 
But the point is, he wants us right there with him, right close, really close, on the same chair with him and the Father. He who hear, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God, the Holy Spirit, is saying this to the churches. Overcome. Be with Jesus. Knock on the door. He wants you in the house. Then God said to us, let, Make man in our image according to our likeness, and let him rule over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every living, creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And we know the story. Right? God created man and woman. Be fruitful and multiply. You've got dominion over everything. I'm putting you in this great place. And then they walked away from God. Ate of the fruit of the tree. Walked away from God. Hid themselves. They had to put clothes on because they didn't want the other person seeing what they were like. All these kind of um, dynamics that, that, that you see with that thing. Hiding. Because they didn't want, you know, they, they, they knew God and how, how he was and how he was holy and righteous. And they'd walked away, they've turned away. And God comes by and says, and again, this is really sad. The Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? God wanted relationship with what he had created, with us who he had created. A lot of times we don't get that. We have all kinds of weird understandings about God and why he created us. Right at the beginning, he created us to have relationship. At the end, he created us to have relationship. That's huge in scripture. If we deny it, we deny what scripture says and we deny the nature of God. <clears throat> and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son for the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He sacrificed for us. The Lord your God is in your midst. A victorious warrior will, will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. God wanted to be with his people. It's demonstrated in the ark of the covenant. It was his presence with his people. It was demonstrated in the temple where the spirit of the, of the holy God, the glory came down filled the temple, the holy of holies, because he wanted to be that demonstration of wanting to be with his people. He wants relationship. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. There is a responsibility that we have in that relationship to seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. God is real. God wants relationship with us. God desires relationship with us. We take the step a relationship, knocking on the door, walking with him, seeking his kingdom, seeking his righteousness. So, God is there, evidenced by nature, evidenced by his creation. He is there also evidenced by his word. The God who is there desires relationship with us. Our responsibility is faith and faithfulness as we walk, as we make transitions. We realize that God is there. The, the, the Matthew passage is in the midst of trouble, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of how, I've, how am I going to live life. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You don't need to worry. God is there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this reality of your presence and your reality. Thank you that you are there, that you are not silent. We thank you for those that have gone before. We thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you for your revelation. Be with us as we walk in this difficult world, seeking first your kingdom seeking first your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.